want to talk about the word wish, W-I-S-H. You, you know that word. Many people think that Christians should not use that word for some reason or other. They think that the word wish should be removed from our vocabulary. It's like saying potluck or pot blessing. I mean, how can you go to a pot blessing and don't even know what you're going to eat? So it's pot luck because then you're going to find out whether it's good or bad, right? But I've had someone once tell me that when I use the word wish, that it should actually be removed from my vocabulary. That Christians should not use that word. So I thought about that, and I looked in the scripture, and I find out that Peter uses the word wish. He says, the Lord wishes for no one to perish. Do you remember that scripture? It's actually in First Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But let me read it to you so you won't have to look it up. It says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to the knowledge, to, or rather, all to come to repentance. Jesus' wish is that everyone become saved. But we know not everybody becomes saved because not everybody wants to believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Okay? And then in the book of Timothy, Paul says something. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Now when he says who desires, it's actually an expression of God's wish, his desire that everybody become saved. Now, I know that we all, everybody is not saved because everybody cannot accept Christ. But we certainly can be careful of what we wish for. But nothing's wrong with wishing for something. I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard about the, the genie in the bottle. How many of you heard that story before? Well, this might be just a little bit different. But it says that this man was on a desert, desert island. He got shipwrecked. He was all alone. He was walking around. He found this bottle. And he had no, no possessions with him. So he took the bottle and he cleaned it up. And as he wiped it and cleaned it, a genie popped out of the bottle. Have you ever experienced that? Oh, Ron, I thought you, if anybody here, I thought it would be you. So the genie said, hey, buddy, you have three wishes. Think about that. And the guy said, okay. He thought, and the genie said, well, what's your first wish? He said, well, my first wish, I want a beautiful house in Hawaii right on the ocean. Poof! There he was in this beautiful house. So the genie asked him, well, what's your second wish? He said, my second wish, I want two Mercedes sitting in my driveway. One hardtop, one convertible. Poof! The genie said, look out your window. He looked out and there were these two beautiful Mercedes, just the right color that he wants. The genie said, well, what is your third wish? And he said, well, I want to think about it. I want to make sure I get the right wish. The genie said, okay, but be careful because it's your last wish. And poof, the genie was gone. So the man looked around his house, saw how beautiful it was, looked out in the driveway, saw those two Mercedes out there and said, I'm going to go for a walk or drive. So he went and got in the car, he got in the convertible. It was a beautiful day, similar to this day, I'm sure. He got in the car and he put the radio on. And then the radio was playing a commercial. And he started to sing with the commercial. Oh, I wish I was a Musk Oscar Mayer wiener. <laughs> Poof! And that's the end of that story. In the first book of John, it says, we have, been, we have testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So the question is, why is it God's wish? Why is it his desire? For all of us to be saved and what are the promises that God gives us with that in mind turn to the book of John chapter 14 verses 1 through 2 and 3 John 14 verses 1 2 and 3 many of you probably know these verses they're very important 
In fact, if you come to any of our Bible studies, when I'm teaching it, you will know that we have studied these verses, and I've encouraged you to memorize the verses the best that you can. But here's what it says. And remember, it is Jesus speaking. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now he's speaking to the believers who have accepted him as the Savior of the world. Well, as I look at these verses, and maybe you can see these as you look in there, I find four promises that Jesus has given us in these verses. First of all, his promise is there are many places in heaven. Not just one or two, a hundred or two hundred, but many places in heaven. Second is, is that he is preparing a place for us. Now, I don't know how he's re preparing that place, but I know Jesus was the best carpenter on this earth. So you can kind of imagine what he is building for each one of us who has, who has believed him as the Savior. Then he says that he will come again. And then that last promise that is so good, he says, and where he is, we will be there also. Now we know God sent Jesus for the whole world. We've read that time and time again in the scripture. But yet not everybody is convinced that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Many people want to see a miracle. They want to see a sign. I know I've talked about signs before. And I've talked about the old movies that I'm sure some of you have seen. I don't know how many of you were raised in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Oh, Ron, I'm sure you have. But although you are younger than I am, but I'm glad you're here. But, you know, it was when I went to movies, they were 10 cents. That's how much a movie cost me. And I remember the first time I went to a movie, I was told that they had raised it one penny. Movies were going to be 11 cents. And I talked to myself, I will never be able to go to a movie again. I mean, 11 cents was a lot of money when I was a little kid. But in the movies, you can always see the signs, the signs that people wanted. Maybe not the signs about knowing Jesus, but the signs about loving somebody. You ever notice that? If you ever gone to movies? That's why I'm a romance mystery writer, because I was raised in these romance movies. Well, it seems like every time something would happen, a girl, before she would marry, would want a sign that that individual was the person for her. I don't know if you remember this or not. I mean, there were little things. There was tingling of the back. If, if, if that's the person... I'll get a tingling back here. And at the end of the movie, you would see the girl scratching the back of her head. You ever notice that? But the one I liked best was when the mother is harping at the girl, go out, get married, find yourself a man. She said, I, I don't, she says, I'll know the man when my shoes fall off my feet. Do you, do you guys remember that at all? You guys are all told you're young, I know. So she looks and looks for a man. Oh, she thinks she finds one. But she can't wait for that guy to kiss her because she wants her shoes to fall off so there will be a sign that he's the one for her. So the end of the movie comes. We all wait for the end of the movie. And the movie focuses on the couple. And he picks her up, he hugs her, and he kisses her. And the, the screen, or the camera rather, focuses down at her feet. And that moment he picks her up and her shoes fall off. Yeah. She knows she has found the man she loves. Many of us, before we accept Jesus Christ, we want a sign. We always say, well, if, if you're really real, you know, uh, find me a job. I'm just going to sit here and lay around. But you find the job for me. We always want a sign. And Jesus warns us about people who always want a sign because we as Christians are supposed to have faith. Because Ephesians tells us it is with faith that saves us by the grace of God. 
many places in the Father's house. In other words, there is room for one more. There's always room for one more in the kingdom of God. Our houses become full. Our motels, our hotels, we see signs out that say vacancy. But we'll never see a no vacancy sign on a cloud in heaven. Because there's always room for one more people. But that's because our Father's heart is as wide as the earth. He's waiting and waiting for each person to come to him and to follow his ways. The next thing in this verse we see that Jesus tells us about the honesty of Jesus. You ever thought about that? He says, he is preparing a place for us. That honesty, for he said, if, I, if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? I mean, it's like saying, would I waste my breath by telling you there's going to be a place if there wasn't any? So here Jesus tells us about that. He tells us that there is a place for every single person that he has created on this earth. I mean, Jesus always spoke the truth. If you search out scriptures, you will see Jesus never lied. He always spoke the truth. He warned us of the pain. He told us that, and he encouraged us about the glory that would happen to us if we followed him. He said, it's not going to be easy to, to follow me. And we see that in our world today, where Christians today are being martyred, where they're being killed, their next heads are being chopped off. And if you look at the news, you'll see what is happening that the Christians nowadays are hated. But yet God warns us that people will hate you if you follow me. So many people may be afraid of that. You know, but here in America, and if you're from Canada, I don't know how many people are here. But if you're in America, we have this freedom of religion. And we really don't have to be too afraid of being put to death because of following Christ. Though we may be rejected, we may be persecuted, we may be laughed at. Those things have happened to me, and I'm sure it's happened to many of you. But I've never really have faced death because of what Christ has done for us. I've had faith, faced prison, you know that, but I've never faced death to follow Christ. But Christ here warns us. He, he tells us of what is going to happen to us when we come to know Christ. And he said here, he said, take up thy cross. If anyone wishes to follow me, Jesus now is using the word wish, by the way. If anyone wishes to follow me, Jesus says, he must deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. To us, when we read this here 2,000 and something years later, that's kind of confusing to us. What does that mean, take up your cross and follow me? But to the Jews, they knew exactly what it meant because they had seen thousands of their men being crucified on the cross because they were Christians. So they knew pick up your cross meant you follow Christ until death. I have, I have been very fortunate in my walk with the Lord. I have been Christian now for over 40 years. And I have really never wavered. I've always stayed strong in Jesus. This is what, what he has given me. He's given me the gift of being, of being able to lead people to Jesus. No matter what the circumstance, at the airport, uh, in an airplane, people sitting next to me. I've always been able to share Christ with the lost people. It's not me. I know it's the power of the Holy Spirit because in the book of Acts, that's what God promises us. He says, when you witness, it's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to do the speaking. So I don't have to be afraid of what I'm going to say. If I say something wrong, well, God, look what you did. I mean, it's not going to be me, right? Because I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. He didn't try to bribe us. Or promise us that if we accept in him, everything was going to be rosy. And most of us who are Christians here today, born again Christians, we know we have gone through trials and tribulations as the world does. But we have something in us that the world, the non-Christians don't have. And that is we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that helps us to overcome the situations that come our way. What does James say? James says, when you go through trials and tribulations, ha, 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 think it joyful. Well, how many of you are really joyful when you go through a trial or a tribulation? I don't see any hands. I hope I'm glad I don't. Yeah, we're not joyful. But what the joy is, when we come out of that trial, when we come out of that tribulation, 
we look back and we see what God has done to us. Because that trial or tribulation brings us closer to God, not far away. If you fall back because you go through tribulation and you blame God, huh, that's your own fault. It's not God's. Because we can grow through those trials and those through tribulations. God is powerful. He, he could have told us, hey, accept me and everything is going to be easy. And then we would accept him and then we would find out it wasn't easy and we would say, oh, Jesus is a liar. But he's not, is he? He's the Savior. And he's always honest with us. He always wants us to know. He didn't try to trick us into following him. Instead, he told us the truth. He told us honestly uh, what, what, what we might expect. I mean, I tell you, it's a great thing being a Christian. We, we may have our trials, but we have someone to lean on to help us get out of it. I have been in danger in many places that I have traveled. I've had communist people watch me with machine guns, Donnie and I both. As you know, I have faced prison in Indonesia. But God was always there. He knew what I could take, and he knew what I couldn't take. Uh, even though I would tell him many times, you were sending the wrong person. Especially when I was facing the prison term. Lord, I'm not Paul. I'm not going to be singing praises to you while I'm in prison. You better send somebody else. God hears us. A lot of times, I don't think he does. Sometimes I wonder, where are you? Where are you at this moment? We have friends now that are going through a, a huge trial in their life, and everything seems to be going wrong with them. Everything. But they're not really holding on to God. They say they are, they think they are, but they're going through such bad trials. It's like God has left them. But on the other hand, we have other Christians who are going practically through the same trial. And they're coming away with smiles on their faces. They're coming away, they know that God has what is best for them. Not easy being a Christian. But the outcome, as we know, is out of this world. Amen? God is so powerful. And then we see our third thing here. Jesus said, I know. Our second thing, yeah, I'm going to prepare a place for you. How many of you really think of that? You know, now that I'm in my, up there in my age now, I had my birthday last night. I think that's why not too many people are here. <laughs> I think they said, well, I saw Chuck last night. I don't have to see him again today. So they're not here. But he is preparing a place for us. He goes in front of us. So that we can follow him. He, he shows us the way. He opens the way. We follow his steps. What greater steps to follow than the steps of Jesus Christ? I mean, those are the steps that we should want to follow. Right behind him, step by step by step as he is walking away. Because he's the one that will lead us to heaven. He's the one that will lead us to God. That's why we must follow and trust in him. Why we must follow in the footsteps. Of Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus has a great sense of humor. Have you ever thought about God's humor? I'm reading a book now that talks about God's humor. And it's, it's amazing what kind of humor he has. I don't know if you've ever been caught up and, and know what you have done. God is in hysterics. Have you ever thought about that? Let me get this bag here for a second. Many years ago, I had a bag like this that I took to Taiwan. And in the bag, I kept my little cassette player. In those days, it was cassettes. Because I, I'm a singer, so I would, churches would invite me to go sing for them and preach for them. And I would take my own cassette with me and my own radio with me, and off I'd go. Well, one day, I was asked to go to church, speaking uh, of church, about two hours away from my live, where I live. I have no car in Taiwan, but there's a train system. But of course, I can't read Chinese, so I never know what train I'm supposed to get on. So someone usually takes me to the airport. They buy my ticket, and then they tell me, get off at the fifth stop. The fifth stop. I said, okay. So the train goes, it stops one. I had a piece of paper, and I write one. The next stop, I write two. Next stop, I write three, four. Fifth stop, I get off. So I got off, the pastor was there, everything was fine. 
sang in this church, spoke. Many people accepted Christ. Came back. They told me the same thing. Get off the fifth station. Come back. I said, okay. So I sat down there and some uh, university students sat by. So they invited me or talk, started talking to me. They spoke English. So I was telling them what I was doing and I was going to get off the plane. And they said, don't take a taxi when you first get off at the, at the train station because they will rob you. Well, I said, okay. I mean, I walk around Taiwan for years. I never had been frightened. But we got back maybe about 11, 11.30 at night. So I got off the scene. I took my, put my radio back in the bag, put it on my shoulder, and I started to walk home. I didn't know how far I should walk before I called a taxi. But all of a sudden, this loud voice started to speak in Chinese. So I knew no idea what that person was talking about. But it was loud. It was on a loudspeaker. So I would stop and I'd look around because many times cars go by um, like a little truck and they have a loudspeaker and someone is talking to them. So I, I waited and I didn't, hear, didn't see anybody. So I kept walking. After a block, that voice was still as loud as it was before. So I'm wondering, what, what is going on here? I'm looking at people. They're looking at me. But I don't know what, what's happening. So I see a big thing up on a window, like on about the third floor. And I thought, oh, that's a loudspeaker up there. So I wait, wait. Voice still talks very loud. So finally I just put my bag down. And I said, what in the world is going on? There's, there's nothing around me. I'm the only one out here now. And this voice is loud. So I went down to pick up my thing. The radio in my cassette went on. And here was this Chinese guy speaking inside my bag. I said, Lord, what a sense of humor you must have. I mean, I couldn't believe it. The next day, I spoke in another church. And, I, and this guy, one of the elders said, I want to take you out for ice cream. I said, okay. And we passed by this thing. And I said, was telling him the story. He was in hysterics. And I said, yeah. I said, I thought that was a loudspeaker. He looked up and he said, that's an air conditioner. Do you think God has a sense of humor? And when we do the things that we do, don't you think he must get this biggest smile on his spiritual face? <laughs> that must be Jesus up there, right? Oh, God, what a blessing he is. Our next one. I am coming again. What a promise God has given us now. I am coming again. Listen to that book of Acts. The angel said to his followers, this is on that great mountain when Jesus leaves us, called his ascension. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. I mean, here is a promise now that not only the, uh, the uh, apostles are going to see him, or his disciples, not only us who are Christians, but now the whole world is going to see him. We know that because of revelations. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. Every eye will see him, but those who reject him, it's going to be too late. You can't make your decision after you make your decision before. I mean, I know we as Christians, we don't know when Jesus Christ is going to come again. But we can be sure he is coming again. He came once as a little bitty baby. And now he's going to come the second time as the king. And he will come and gather us into his arms. The next in this, these verses we read is that Jesus gives us a promise to all believers. For he said, where I am, there you will be also. Is that a great promise? promise to us who believe in him that where Jesus is we will be there also with him what a great thing that is a promise to us from Jesus he is a great truth and it's put in the most simplest way heaven is where Jesus Christ is heaven is where you will be with him and his father God a place where we'll be forever and ever and ever I mean that in itself should be enough for us. 
That in itself should, is why we should want to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Not for the blessings on this earth, and there will be, but the greatest blessing of all, to spend eternity with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. 